All right, we're back. We're live. James is here with us this week, and we have Tony Gravely versus Anthony Burchuk for our first fight of the card. Um, Anthony Burchuk in his fight, last fight against uh, Gustavo Lopez in the UFC pretty much got outclassed by Gustavo, and remember, I think it was last week or two weeks ago, Gustavo didn't look too good. No. So, you got Tony Gravely coming here, known as a grappler, but he's been working on his striking. Striking. What do you think is going to happen in this fight? Burchek is a, uh, I believe, Division II college wrestler. Did pretty well in that uh, out of Arizona. And he owns his own um, kind of fan of jiu-jitsu place. So he really has focused on using that wrestling to turn it into some jiu-jitsu. And he fancies himself a jiu-jitsu ace. But he's lost a few times now by, uh, by submission. Which kind of makes the question where his game's at. He's he's pretty well rounded. He brings everything together well. This is his second second stint in the UFC after coming off a loss, I believe, coming back into the UFC. So there's a lot of questions there. Some people would even ask why he's getting this second shot. And I guess Tony Gravely, I think it's just bad timing for this matchup. Tony Gravely has had a wealth of competition. He's only lost to uh, Brett Johns. Who else has he lost to over there? Tony Gravely has got losses to Brett Johns and Patricia or Patrick and Nix, who's doing stuff in uh, Bellator right now, and Manny Bermudez. So those are all like it's been high level competition. And Marab Davish. Yeah, and Marab Davish. Yeah. So that's those are some uh, some good wins, and I think to have those wins before you get into the UFC really says something. And for him to uh, you see a lot of guys coming to the UFC, they're hype on them, they're doing well, they're training on their own, doing their own thing. He's already had those those staple losses to grow off of. And he's joined a better gym at ATT, and he's taken a lot from a lot of those guys, like Pedro Munoz, and uh, who else? Uh, the dude we just saw fight, uh, Demetrius Johnson, Mariah, you got Dustin Poirier. You got Dustin Poirier, you got all these guys. And I, and I truly think that working with those guys is really going to help him uh, round out that skill set. I think Jorge Masvidal is about to take him. Yeah. So, I mean, for his striking to be improving, too, and getting those guys. And coming from a grappling base, too. Yeah. I think we're going to see a really, really good version of Tony Gravely here, and I have him in a few parlays this week. Yeah. That'd be on Tony Gravely. Tony Gravely is the pick. And another thing, Burchak's 34 years old, so he's on his second stint, and at 34 years old, it's not really a good look. No, I th- this is a, it's a bad <laughs> matchup. I mean, if you could have taken these guys at different points in their career, and it would have been a better matchup, but the timing as it is. Looking at the split, I think Tony Gravely takes it. Yeah, Tony Gravely all the way. Austin Hubbard versus Dakota Bush. Now, before we talk about how good Austin Hubbard is and his cardio, Dakota Bush, a little background on him since he's coming What's in. What's his nickname? Harry. Dakota Harry. Harry Bush. Harry Bush. <laughs> now, you know how I'm hype on Bryce Mitchell. He's, he's an up-and-coming star. Yeah. Dakota Bush is a training partner with Bryce Mitchell. Mm-hmm. Coming out of that gym. It's a good gym to come out of. He's 26 years old. So maybe this is one of those situations like the, uh, what's his name? The guy that quit on the stool that fought Austin Hubbard. Yeah, yeah, Max. Max, Max Hoff. Hoff, 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 Hoff. Yeah, whatever his last name is. I think this could be a similar scenario to that where Dakota isn't quite on the same level as Austin Hubbard. But at the same point saying that, I think Austin Hubbard has a problem here with Dakota Bush's wrestling and could cause problems. Maybe the first round you see Dakota Bush come out, push the pace heavy. And then maybe tire out because you said something about him not looking good at Wayne's. You read that? Yeah, no, yeah. I don't think he looked too good at Wayne's. I would short sure notice too. But the thing is, yeah, like you said, he does. Austin Hubbard is a uh, he's a striker. He wants to he wants to keep you at distance. Use his pressure standing to really wear you down, and it's been effective in the UFC. He's lost to Davi Ramos, Marco Madsen, and Joe Selecki, which I don't think you can yeah. compare to go to push to the the grappling acumen of any of those guys. And uh, in both Davi Ramos and Marco Madsen, um, the third round, the third round, Austin Hubbard came back and, and won both of those third rounds against Joe Selecki. He defended four takedowns in a row, which is pretty impressive after seeing Jim Miller eat a takedown. But he just couldn't keep him off his back and ended up getting a quick submission. I think you can kind of write that off as a like two two. Uh, what happens when you put two prospects in there together? So one's higher than the other. Right, right. Something's gonna happen, but I don't think it takes too much off Austin Hubbard's uh, his wealth here in the in, in the UFC. I think he's gonna do well, and I think uh, especially in the short notice, Bush has the right game plan to put him in here and wrestle with him. But I don't think he's gonna be able to keep Hubbard down, and I do think he will tie this and quite the wins. Yeah, and Hubbard trains in Colorado, high elevation, so that's another thing. He just 
I think he actually gets working with Curtis Blades as well. Yeah. I think he yeah. trains with Curtis. So that's. I don't, I mean, uh, there's no with with Justin Gaethje and Drew Dober. There's no question that he's going to be able to bang and stay there for three rounds. So I think that I have to pick uh, Austin Hubbard in this spot. I could see why uh, stylistically people would be on Dakota Bush, but Austin Hubbard's in there, and I think that uh, I'm going to pick him in the third round. I'm trying to pick one of these third round props, you know, it's probably think it's the one I'm going to see. Yeah, Austin Hubbard. He's on record saying he wants to finish somebody in this fight. And his last opponent that he had, Dakota Bush, is replacing him. So, Austin Hubbard's gunning for the finish, so that could be a good bet. And I think Austin Hubbard wins this fight, but I wouldn't be surprised if Dakota Bush makes it a fight. He's going to be live, though, because even if the fight starts out, Dakota Bush has a great first round wrestling-wise. Even if he has a great second, I still got to be careful. Yes. Gerald Marshart versus... Bartos Babinski. Um, Bartos Babinski is pretty much going to come out here and try to grapple Gerald Marshart the entire time. Rest. Grapple. Yeah. Rest. He's, he's, <laughs> he's going to either hold him down and just kind of lay on top of him, or he's going to have to keep taking him down. And Marshart, he's coming off that 18-second knockout against Kamzat, but Kamzat's kind of like, we don't know where he's at. Still. Right, but you can go back further than that. That's not the only blemish on him. Mirchart's record over there. The dude is showing a chin, but uh, he lost to Eric Andrews back in 2019, the split decision, which, I mean, it is what it is, I guess. I mean, it's not. Ian Hines is come is still in the plans. Jack Romance and Kevin Holland. But the Ian Hines one, it, it shows that he got knocked out in the first minute. So in his last two fights, he's been in there for under a minute and a half. So that worries me. I think he used to have a great chin. I think that might have uh, dwindled a little bit here. The worry on this one is Babinski is on record just like he, he tells you like it is. He's going to take the person down and he's going <laughs> to hold him down. He doesn't care about what the fans think. That being said, he has been caught in submissions. The last one was against uh, Nito Nunes. But uh, that one, he uh, <clears throat> he de- successfully defended a, a submission. Uh, I think it was he, he popped his head right out and he just... He just it sat there for one second and got caught in an arm I think that was a great adjustment by Nunez. And uh, the other one, the guillotine choke, I think he definitely worked on that. That's why we saw him get out of that one against Nunez. He just didn't see the next one coming. So that that chain submission game is something that would worry me. It's some it's an area of UFC where Mirchard has excelled. He has the most. He's caught. Yeah. 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 But again, it's another fight where uh, I don't know how it is timing wise. Like, if you took it, the best of, of Gerald Mercer versus the best of Babinski would be a better fight. But, I mean, Mirchard has a lot to prove. Is it too late? Is he over the hump? It's kind of like an angry Sam Alvey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't, uh, yeah, it's, it's a tough one, really, for me. It really is. I like Babinski by decision in this one. I don't think, I think Mirchard might have a small advantage on the feet. And that that chance for a Hail Mary submission, but I don't like to take guys based on based on the fact that they could throw something crazy up. I like Fabinski in the spot. I'm just I'm not gonna bet on it personally, but I think he could or, or edge out that ugly decision. I think Bartos Binsky is just a bigger version, not such a good as wrestler as Darren Wynn. And Gerard Mercer beat Darren Wynn just because he was bigger, like the size man. Yeah, yeah, the size man is crazy. But I think Fabinski can get this one done against Mershart as long as he doesn't get caught by any submissions. Yeah. <clears throat> I think he'll be sweating it if he does Fabinski though. Jessica Pena versus Lupita Gonzalez. Gondinis, whatever you say. How do you say her name? She's a newcomer. Uh, Jessica Pena hasn't fought in three years. Her last fights were against uh, jo- Joanna, uh, Jessica Andrade, and Daniel Taylor. And the Daniel Taylor is the one that really cut in. Makes you wonder how she's going to come in here looking against uh, Godinius. And uh, Lupita has actually got really good stand-up. And from what I've seen in the footage, Penne doesn't like to get hit. And uh, if she puts the pressure on Penne and can stay off the back, like stay off of her back and take him down, because she likes, Penne likes to throw like that headlock toss mm-hmm. a lot. Yeah, she's going to go for control. Yeah, I think if she can stay out of that, you're going to see uh, maybe a finish in this spot. I don't know how you stop quite up looking at it. I don't know how the UFC set this up because you have to go back to find Jessica Penny's last win. You have to go back to 2014 against Ronda Marcus. <laughs> Split decision. 
That's a long time. That's and before that, she was losing points, and after that, she lost all of them. She actually, she actually got a, a, a total shot. I mean, she won off that split decision in the market. So, I mean, back in the day, she could survive against these these high-level killers, but I think it's another one. I've, I've been talking about this a lot on this card, but the timing of these matchups, it seems like they're not looking at the, the career trajectory, it's just what they've done before. And I don't know much about the newcomer in Ubida, but I, I'm, I would not pay Ben A with any amount of money. Well, I don't know who who it was that she fought, Lupita, before she came here in the UFC. Let's see it. But it was a five round fight, and they were comparing her to what Jessica. I guess it was with Demopolis. Oh, okay. They were comparing her to what Jessica did back three years ago. How good she was. Decent competition over there, though. Okay. And she made uh, a bet. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Majority decision over her. So. Yeah, that's, I like. I that's like all of them good. Yeah, I like Adina. Is is uh, I like her. Uh, she's gonna win this. I think she's going to win. And I think she can finish. I think... Uh, I would never bet a finish on a women's yeah. strawweight fight, but it does look like a mismatch to me. Godinez in rounds one to three is a bit good bet. I think it's plus money as well. Plus 200 at least. Take that. That's a good bet. That's a good one, guys. Alexander Romanov versus Juan Espinino. And I before this fight even happened, <clears throat> I've been high on Romanov. I like his wrestling. And I think the big the big difference in this fight is going to be that Romanov has a sumo background. And when you're wrestling, controlling body weight and knowing what the body's going to do, I think Romanov's just way ahead of Espinino, and you're going to see that in this fight. And as long as Romanov doesn't somehow pull him on top of him or doesn't get taken down himself, we don't really know how good his takedown defense is because nobody's trying to wrestle him because he's such a good wrestler. He's always pressuring forward. He's yeah. trying to hard to get that angle. I think if nobody, long, nobody has tried to take him down. He's, they've yeah. been backed up every time. Yeah. I think as long as uh, it doesn't stay standing, because Romanov doesn't have a stand-up at all, I think Romanov's going to just take him down continuously and got ground and pound, maybe. Romanov's almost like like he just took uh, like the craziest martial arts and like put him in a bowl and just let him mash it up. He's got just weird... He's, uh, I forget what his striking is, but he trains at his, like, some gym in... Where he's from, just gonna, like in a garage. He's uh, <laughs> a, garage. a wrestling champion of some sort and sumo, and then he had some striking background that was crazy too. I want to say like kung fu or something like that. But on the feet, he looks very green to me. He looks like each shot doesn't really check him, and uh, he's always just looking to close that distance and throw you on your head. Even when he gets to the ground, I think overall his game does look very green, but he's got a good. He uses those mixed mixed martial arts that I that I mentioned well. He increments them well in his game plan, and he's got crazy intangibles as well, speed and size and, and strength. Uh, Espino on the other side just seems to me like a guy who's a uh, more like has a, a built game like fundamentally from the ground up. It, it, on the feet, I'd say he has a small advantage just because of how green Romanov looks. And when it comes to the wrestling, you're really going to see it different wrestling from Romanov to Espino. But they're both champions in their own right. I think if it's going to be a tough fight if Espino can really make it a tactical fight. If he can find a way to to uh, make Romanov either miss coming in or just, just slow the pace down a little bit, even last in the second round, I think he could make it a grueling fight and I'm not be worried, but like you, I'm, I'm high on Romanov. I like watching him. This dude has a lot to offer, but I don't think a loss would be the worst thing for his career. No. Uh, another thing to mention is Romanov hasn't had a fight go to decision at all in his career. So, How far has he made it? I mean, 13, 13 fights. Right. Farthest round he's been in yeah. was uh, three. He's been in three. Okay, so he's been in third round. I, don't, I didn't see that fight, so I didn't see how he was holding up from there, but it's good to see at least. He has a fight won by slam. <laughs> this dude is a savage. I like him. Yeah, yeah. I think I'm gonna have to go Romanov, but this is a fantastic fight for three months. I don't. It's you can't have both of these great grapplers at the top of the heavyweight division. They gotta let one go on, and the other, and the other one can try to find his way back, find his way back. Yeah, I think I think Romanov's gonna win, but if he fights somebody like a Tom Aspinall, he's in trouble. If somebody can put striking on you, you're in trouble. Doesn't matter how good you are wrestling, you gotta work on your feet. Yeah. Now we got Tracy Cortez versus Justine Kish. 
Uh, Justin Kish, 33 years old. Tracy Cortez, 27, new upcoming fighter. She's trading at a fight ready in May. Um, her last fight against Edgar, Edgar, I think you say our name. She was supposed to be a pretty good fight, but Tracy Cortez made it look easy on the ground, taking her down all continuously. And I think you're going to see a, bit, a similar here uh, against Justin Kish. I think Tracy Cortez is going to mix in the wrestling and just wear on Justin Kish. And Justin Kish isn't known for getting off her back once she's there. Right. What, what? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a young <laughs> grappler versus an older striker in this fight, as far as I'm concerned. It, 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 just, it, it never works out. And it, it, even looking at uh, Kish as the striker in her last fight here, she came out and lost to Mazza, who we saw... I mean, if you put Mazza in there against her, she would love to Mazza. Yeah, we saw that's not take... the way for Mazza. But Mazza is a young green striker, and the fact that she choked her. Yeah, not well. That was the that was the uh, club and stuff. She knocked her down and then and then submitted her. But coming from somebody who fancies himself a striker, that's not great to see. Uh, I mean, Kish's method of victory is definitely to keep it on the feet and eke out a decision. But I don't think that's going to happen. I think all of these. All these uh, lower level uh, women's MMA fights, especially at the lower weight classes, they hit the ground. And I think that once it does, Cortez is going to have a definite advantage, and it's probably one of the safer picks on the card, honestly. Yeah, Tracy Cortez is probably going to just out grapple her, and that's my pick for the fight as well. <clears throat> now we got Luis Pena versus Alex Nunes. It should be a fun one. Um, Louis Pena, I can kind of compare him to what Mike Perry did last was it last week. Mike Perry, yeah, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Mike Perry did everything right, said all the right things, came in, looked really good, was a pound underweight. He was known for missing weight a lot. Um, Louis Pena came in first on the scales and the weigh-ins, looks really good. He's moving up in weight here to lightweight. Oh, okay. Yeah, so um, he's got a wrestling background too, but Alex Munoz is just. Way ahead of him, I think, in wrestling. But the yeah. problem is the striking. Uh, Luis Pena has an advantage in that. Oh, no, no, no. I think he has a little bit of advantage. He, if he would have used his reach that he had, I would agree with you. But he's not very good at using that reach. He's a, he's more of a scramble guy. And really, when you get in, he, he's trying to get your back. He wants to get on your back in every fight. Anybody he fights, he's trying to get their back. And it's just one of those things, like I said earlier, you can't pick someone based off of off of one method of victory, especially against a guy like uh, we see over here in uh, Munoz, who is the uh, wrestling coach of Team Alpha Male, known for their wrestling, and in his, in his uh, UFC debut, came in undefeated, fought Nazareth Haparast, who is a beast on the feet, and Nazareth Haparast was able to defend his takedown, stuff him, and force him to strike with him, and we saw Munoz survive it. I think if you can survive Nazareth Haparest, yeah, you can survive, survive Penny. You will survive Penny. I don't think Penny has the ability to stuff the takedown like Haparest did. And I think we're going to see a wrestling clinic as an underdog here. And this is the, this is the underdog pick of the night right here. Yeah, Harak Haparest, I think, has like a 90% takedown defense. And Luis Pena has a 45% takedown defense. Now, <laughs> and look at who they're fighting. Too. Yeah. I mean, as of late, uh, Penny has been in there against wrestling. But he struggles against wrestling. And uh, he, he changed camps and went to uh, AKA just to work on that. And and you saw in his fights after that, that it didn't work out for him. He's been taken down a lot since then. And now he's already he's moved over to ATP, I'm pretty sure. So the guy kind of just keeps trying to find his footing. I think, I mean, I like that in, in, in a way because he is definitely looking for what he's good at. He's got, he's got. He's, he's a professional. He does everything right. He weighs in first. He, he trains with the right people. He says the right things online. He just might not be that good. Yeah, I just don't think he's found in his, in his style. He's just trying to he's trying to be the best at everything. And really, you don't really – he's not shining in any way. You know what I mean? And, and along with that, he's also not making those improvements in the wrestling I need to see, especially against, you know, that plus, plus 110 underdog numbers on there. I'm going to – I'm picking, you know, all day. Yeah, I think the UFC realized when they gave Alex Munoz against Karak Press, that was kind of a big move. And yeah. now they're like, hey, who has bad takedown defense? Luis Pena. All right, well, let's Well, the other thing you got to look at, too, is Pena was supposed to fight your car close. Yeah. What, two, three weeks ago? And now they're on the same card. And now they're on the same card, fighting different guys. It wasn't the co-main event, so 
Yeah, I, yeah, I think that there's a reason for that. We might not know it, but yeah, I definitely think that uh, Alex Munoz is the underdog of the night here. Yeah, I have to pick Alex Munoz as well. Hopefully, he can get it done. I like to parlay him with Tony Gravely. Yeah, I'll have, yeah, we'll put it down on our bets on the page. We got Abdul Razak Al Hassan versus Jacob Malkoon. And uh, Jacob Malkoon, if I was watching the. Somebody did a film study on how he got knocked out by Phil Hawes in like 18 seconds. And the, the pressure was what did it. And he was up against the cage. And he was like feeling for the cage with his hand like he didn't know where it was at. He gave him nowhere to go. Yeah. No way out. Yeah. And Phil Hawes had his. He noticed that he had his hand on the cage. So he threw a left hook. And then, for some reason, Jacob Malkoon brought his left hand over to cover the right side of his face, and it opened up the right side of his face, and he was already loaded up with his right hand and came over and just oh, flipped him. Man. So, I mean, Jacob Malkoon wasn't really showing you that he really has, like, the knowledge of how to defend on his feet. Especially coming here at 4, it, it, coming to the UFC at 4 and up. Yeah. What are you doing? He's just... This, leave this guy on the regional scene for a little bit. Let him cook. And he not didn't, done. He didn't look that impressive on the regional either. Like I was watching. Right. Yeah, he wasn't. He wasn't uh, knocking people out or anything. And yeah. Even his submission, his submission game was. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. this is a fight also that I think we don't really know where either one of these fighters are at because Abdul just got knocked out by Chaos Williams in thirty seconds, and Chaos Williams just lost to Pereira. Now that guy's a weird guy to fight, but. I think there's a lot of just kind of lucky punches landed in the fight you just mentioned. Yeah. Not lucky, but shit could have happened. I think uh, Abdul uh, Razak Al-Hassan has a lot to prove here. He's missed weight twice now, I think. He's up a weight now, though. So. Yeah, so that could help him. I, I don't think he's going to struggle. This dude is fucking huge <laughs> at, uh, what was that, 170? Yeah. Yeah, so at 185, I don't think it'll be problems. And uh, Malkoon wasn't a bigger guy. But what is the UFC doing to Malkoon, man? I mean, Robert Riker is just like, yo, get my, get my buddy on your card. And they're like, all right. And so they match him up with Phil Hawes. Abdul Razak Al-Hassan is Phil Hawes. Just a little bit worse. <laughs> I don't even know. I think he's a little bit more unpredictable. And I mean, if you're Malcolm, it's the same game plan. Survive the first round. So I just think this is a, a tough spot to pick Malcolm for anybody. Unless you're personal friends with this guy, I think it's going to be a hard one to pick him for. I, I don't know how much I like Austin in this spot either, though. And the, uh, was it, minus 300 uh, chalk on Al-Hassan? That's, that's scary. I don't I don't know if it's bet bettable parlay piece, but definitely not. I feel, I feel like this is one of those fights that happens all the time on every card. It's like yeah. we know this dude's a knockout artist. He's gonna come out and knock this dude out. Yeah. Maybe they, because he's been knocked out. Maybe he's been knocked out. Maybe they're both hesitant. Maybe, mm. maybe it takes a little bit. I didn't take that route. Well, I did look at, when I was scrolling through the bets of this fight, and I saw the one where it's like this fight ends in sixty seconds, and I was like, ooh. I mean, there's always this fight on a card. And <laughs> always, you always expect. Something to happen, and then the most unexpected thing happens. Like, look at Jorgen the Right. Got knocked. Well, I mean, it is somebody was going to win. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Don't be betting on this fight because you don't know what's going to happen. But yeah, I'd have to agree. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard a lot of people online saying it's the lock, the, the first round knockout. That's the problem. That's, that's the problem. That's scary. Yeah. I, like that. I think Abdul as well gets it done, but I am not touching this fight. Nah, man. All right. Andre Arlovski versus Chase Sherman. And a tough one to pick. Yeah, I said that same thing as well, but as I as the fight's getting closer and closer, I've looked into it more and more. I just think Arlovski is going to be better on the feet, and Chase Sherman doesn't present anything on the ground. Look at that record, man. That doesn't even look real. 30 and 20. Uh, and it's he's a, been through some war. He's coming back off of a quick fight. Like, he just lost to... Uh, he is always <laughs> trained. This guy has been in it. Oh, and when back in the day, he was, yeah, he's been through all of the, the major promotions. He's been through all the phases of the sport. And, yeah, I heard somebody else say it. I'm not going to give credit, but he really just does go out there and spars these guys. He just spars them. So, I mean, do you see what he did against uh, Bozer? And we both had Bozer in that fight. We both were pretty mad about that one. But, I mean, he made it a tough, grindy Fight from the outside, out point them kind of deal. And I don't think we're going to see the same fight out of this one because I think that, uh, I think Sherman is a little bit more like, uh, like the mind games is where it I don't think he would sit back for 15 minutes. He gets hit a lot too. Right. And I think, I think he would, ch will charge forward with that risk of getting knocked out to risk 
Ten, ten out of ten. Is it the guy? Yeah. He played bare knuckles, so yeah, he's yeah, ready to bat. Yeah, yeah. I do. I mean, his, he was. Uh, I don't know if he was cut from the UFC or what, but he failed for some PEDs. And then he was over there in bare knuckle boxing, won a couple, lost to the champion over there, and he's come back and now he's training at Team Elevation with Derek Lewis. And, I mean, not Derek Lewis, uh, Derek Lewis' son. <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of guys, that, good guys up there, and I think that's a good, I mean, training move for him. But as it stands, I would never put money on Chase Sherman. He's kind of just like the, he's like the bizarro Derek Lewis. He's I, like everything opposite. I just looked, and like I said, I'm high on our last game in this fight. Chase Sherman's record in the UFC is two and six. So I mean, maybe he's just not the level of competition like for the UFC. Yeah. But as an older guy, I mean, you you're usually using that as a yeah as a deterrent to pick guys. But our last game looks good as an older right. guy. So. But the chance of him getting knocked out is there. It is there, but I, I have to pick Arlovsky, Another one I'm not putting on my slip. I would say I would say that the chance of getting knocked out is there, but he took a shot clean from Aspinall. He did, and he and he returned. Yeah. At the end of that first round, he yeah. No, I don't. I don't think Arlovsky's out of there. Yeah, I think. And I think yeah. I mean, you should be using Arlovsky to fight these uh, these up and comers, and he was supposed to fight Parker Porter, but I mean. I don't know, man. Short notice. I'm maybe really high. He's been training. Maybe he's really changed his game up. I, I could see it. That's why I'm not laying any money on it. <laughs> but Arlovsky by decision is a pretty, pretty likely outcome in this fight. All right. Now we got Jakar Close versus Jeremy Stevens. Probably the one we disagree on. Yeah. Um, it's tough to say, but. It's a uh, close fight. It really is. This one is the one that has some heat on the uh, face off. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's not necessary, yeah. man. I, mean, like, I think that's part of the game plan, though, for Jeremy Stevens. He wants him to come in because that's how Jakar Close fights. If you look at how he lost. Yeah, you can kind of entice him into a brawl, you mean? If you look yeah. how he lost to Dari Noosh, he was putting the, putting the work on him. And then. Like, I think he really thought he had that he had uh, Darnoosh, like dead to rights. I really think he thought he I, I thought he was fucking out there. Yeah, I mean, I'm on Stevens here just because. I feel like he's got the better defense this way. That's the only reason. I think I think this is going to be a war. I think it's going to be a war, too. Jakar Close has an interesting style where he boxes from, like, a kicking distance. He kind of, like, he uses pressure and lateral movements to kind of move around the guy and step in and out of it. You can compare him to Robert Whitaker, I guess, in that, like, he stays on the outside, doesn't really throw much from out there, just faints, he looks around, makes the angles, and reads. And then he comes in and closes the distance. Like you said, when he comes in and closes the distance, he tags you. He's going to stay in there and try and land more shots. But if you can survive that and counter him, that's that's big. That's uh, that's how you can put Jakar Cliff out. But, I mean, he, he can fight for 15 minutes, no problem. And I think that the UFC sees the prospect in this guy. I really do. He hasn't won anything by a knockout in the UFC, which is interesting because we talked about it a lot. But, um... I, I really just think they're tough stylistic matchups, and I don't. The way he does give up that Darnoosh fight, that's the first time he's done that, man. He's never extended combinations like that before. I, I think he really wanted that knockout. But to play into what you were saying, after somebody pushed you away and played back, you probably want that same knockout in this fight. Yeah, and the thing is, we talk, we talked about it too before we went live. Jeremy Stevens hasn't won a fight in four years, I think it is. Mm-hmm, 2018, yeah. He's on a current four fight loss streak. It's just killers. It's just two absolute killers. Your car closed fights like Mike Perry did the last. He just keeps his head on the center line. He's throwing a bunch at you. Mike Perry wasn't throwing as much, but I just don't like the way he keeps his head there. And J- Jeremy Stevens hits real hard. It could definitely come down to the mind games because if your car closed tries to close the distance, close the distance, he could really mess up and get tagged. But at the same time, I feel like if your car closed plays his game plan and stays to the outside and picks Jeremy Stevens apart, he will get. Straight. Yeah, it's gonna depend on who 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 executes their game plan right and doesn't let the other guy infiltrate their their mind and make them make the move. I think it's gonna be a great fight, I really do. And we haven't even said this yet this on this uh, prediction video, but this might be fight tonight. We actually haven't. Yeah, no, yeah, I think this may be. Yeah, this or Romanov and Espino. Nah, Romanov's gonna dominate. That's okay. Like, 
hundred percent. No, I don't. I don't, yeah, I think this is a this is a close fight, but I'm gonna have to pick close based on what he's done recently for me. I know that Jeremy Stevens has been beaten, but by a really good guy. He fought in the WEC and he, he knocked out Dos Anjos. That was eight years ago, ten years ago. This guy's been in the game for a long time. He trains with Dominic Cruz at uh, Alliance. They're, it's a good team out there. He's prepared, but I think it's for Carl close to time. I mean. I could be wrong that this could be the knockout that surprises me, but I really will be shocked because I really don't see where Jeremy Stevens goes. All right. So I'm going to go with Jeremy Stevens. You're on close. Yep. <clears throat> All right. Minute. We got Robert Whitaker versus Kevin Gaslin. You see, did you think that Kevin Gaslin looked a little bit better on the scale than he usually does? I think he that. He usually comes in looking pretty shitty, but he looked. I thought he looked pretty decent on the scale this week. Well, I told you his girlfriend is like a fitness trainer, so. Right, but that was for his last fight, too. He didn't, he didn't look great against Tynish. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I just think that uh, this is one of those easier fights to say because Whitaker is just, I think, levels ahead of him in the striking. Kevin Gaston's supposed to be a good boxer, but I don't think. I don't you think he's got the speed. You're an old guy. I don't think he's got the speed. And I don't he's think, got the speed. Not against Whitaker. Whitaker he's got. Guy. Hand speed, when it comes to hand speed, I don't think many people beat Kelvin Gaston, honestly. Yeah, but we the, kept up with, with Izzy because of it. I think it's the more than game. The yeah, game. yeah. I think that all plays in effect. Yeah. And Whitaker's just fast. Yeah. And he's not going to let you hit him. He's, he's in and out. He's like, yeah. Well, that's how he's lost, too. If you look at, well, not even just lost, that's how he's been hurt. If you see against Till, he closed in the distance. Till timed that perfect elbow, put him down and almost out. Adesanya caught him at the big at the end of the first round or second round and did the same thing, knocked him down, and then continued and knocked him out the same way. You can catch Robert Whitaker coming in and lunging in on shots with you like this, but at the same time, he's the best ever in the game. He like that kind of style. He sits on the outside and he picks people apart. And when he comes to the 185 pound division, there's a lot of there's a lot of drama going on up there right now. Is he looks beatable? Vittori wants that rematch. But Whitaker is the only one out here making moves to deserve that shit. I mean, I think Whitaker watching that fight against Adesanya and Jan sees that maybe he can mix in the wrestling and maybe that the fight next time will be a little different. Yeah, but if, I, if that's his game plan, I would like to see him come out here and implement a good a wrestling game plan against Kelvin Gaston. Who is a really good wrestler in himself. Yeah, so why, why not test yourself there? And, but I think they were going to see a classic Robert Whitaker performance. Some people, when you take a loss like that to Izzy, like, you're done. Like, he was at the top of the mount. He beat Yoel twice. He's been through some wars. And he came back, and he almost got knocked out against Till. So, I mean, and he can't, He comes back, and he wins that fight. And beats Jared Cannon here, who everybody thought was a prospect coming up. And, dude, that was an incredible performance. The head kick could have not broke his arm. Yeah. That was an incredible performance. I think Robert Whitaker has come back from the grave. I think the Reaper has come back from the grave in this one. I think that... After that Izzy fight, he put a lot of stuff together, and he's, I mean, is there a, what, at middleweight, other than Izzy, what streak is beating Till and, and uh, Kennedy? Yeah. Till, Kennedy, or Gaston, you put those in there, that's, yeah, there's not anybody else in there. They're all in the top five, so, yeah. I mean, this was supposed to be Paul Acosta, and I think Robert Whitaker was another thing that would be a little, a little yeah. So I mean, it doesn't really change much except that this fight was supposed to happen before. I think they're both game players that respect each other. I think we're going to have a five round back and forth. I think it's going to have its moments, but I think Robert Whitaker is going to uh, going to land more impactful shots, and uh, it's going to. I think he's going to win a pretty pretty decisive decision. Yeah, I like Robert Whitaker in this fight as well, and I just think he's just going to outpoint him. I think as long as he doesn't get clipped. It's pretty much over for Kevin Gass. I mean, he doesn't have it. He doesn't have the skills that Robert Whitaker possesses. If I were in charge of the UFC, I would give him the winner in this. And, yeah, because they. I think whoever wins this, more so Bobby Knuckles, but both of them have have uh, earned their rematch. And Kevin Gass has already showed you five rounds of him. So yeah, yeah, and I just think that there's such a, like I said before the show, there's such a decisive margin between at the top of 185. I mean, you got Izzy, you got Rob. You got Till, you got Tori, maybe Costa, and then you got Kelvin Gaston in the middle there, and then all those other guys, Jack Marinton, Kevin Holland, all those other guys. Derek Brunson in there somewhere. But even if you look at that, Derek Brunson is top in the first round against Robert Whitaker. So I think I think Robert Whitaker's 
I mean, just to go to resume, it, you could, you're not you're not gonna hear a mask for that title shot bag for that fight against Easy Guy. Yeah, just set it up after this fight if you win. All right, so we're both on Robert Whitaker. Make sure you uh, tune into the page a little bit later, in a few hours from now. We'll have our picks post up, picks up for bets. Uh, you got anything to add? Ben Askren's gonna win tonight. Ben, a- <laughs> ben Askren better win tonight. Make Jake Paul look like an idiot. All right, that's Peace it. Out.